Um, I was a writer. I was actually the death of a superhero was a script I'd been working on. And uh, I submitted it. I heard about this thing. Um, uh, and uh, I happily got an email saying, you're in. It was in Paris and uh, I traveled over there. And it was all very exciting. Um, I wasn't used to being accepted into anything. Um, and uh, it was beautifully organized, as, as these all are. Um, and I was pretty much convinced that my script was a masterpiece and that it maybe needed a few commas rearranging, but other than that, it was good to go. Well, I was very quickly disabused of that. I, one, one, I remember one of the mentors, supervisors, said quite memorably, there's only three things wrong with your, your script that I can see, uh, the ending, the middle, and the beginning. <laughs> So we, um, we started there and they, they unpacked the whole script and it was all lying on the floor. But, but there was such an array of very talented people that they helped me put it back together before I left. So I left um, with a very good feeling. And then I met you and you invited me no, then. I knew you before that. Did you? Yeah. Then I put you up for that. Oh, okay. That's what it was. <laughs> That's what it was. That's how we heard about it. Okay. But then we were working. And then you invited me to back as a, as a mentor next time. Yes. So then I came back a couple more times and had the very good uh, fortune to work with a lot of uh, new writers. And it's actually really good from the supervisor's mentor's point of view too, because it's a real workout on um, coming fresh to someone else's idea that's already very, very developed um, and working out how it can be made better. And to do, to do that is quite a, quite a gymnastic exercise. It's quite taxing to um, completely immerse yourself in someone else's story and imagine where it could be made better. Um, and it's really, it's like going to the gym, mm. creatively. Mm. It's, a, it's a total workout. Mm. Um, we were talking earlier about your theory about making yourself talented. Mm. Would you like to talk a bit about that? Pretty simple. It's basically that talented, talent is not um, something that's delivered in the, in the cradle. It's, it's something that's made. It's, it's won through a lot of hard work. And my belief is that it is the result of sustained and heavy demands on the creative parts of your brain. That's how you make yourself talented. Some people, um, through deep interest in, in some particular area, become talented when they're young because of that immersion and, and going to that part of the brain early. Some people develop a fascination with something later and find in their 50s they're suddenly talented. Um, in my own case, I derived this theory because I'm certain, however I assess my current position, um, I'm certainly better at what I do now than what I, um, than what I was previously capable of. And so I began to ask myself, um, what happened between my early 20s and so forth when I had potential, but I, I had very, very severe limits in what I could achieve. What I could, um, I was intimidated by concepts. I was unable to quite deliver. There was a profound sense of uh, frustration. Um, and that differs now from a feeling I have, either rightly or wrongly. I, I, I go into, uh, for example, I have five feature films in development with major studios and with directors attached. And, um, and I'm able to handle that. And I'm able to jump between one of those projects at any given hour of the day. And I'm able to handle that. So I started to look into it and um, did some research. And neuroscientists, um, Came, are coming up with some really interesting discoveries about talent and creativity and how it's, how it, how it's created, how, how we make the most of our own potential. And I'll give you an example. There's, um, in London, they have black cab drivers, which is basically the, the classic taxi service in London. London is a complete maze. It's not a grid system like New York. So to navigate your way around London and know any given street is a phenomenal achievement. And they 
black cab drivers are asked to know every street in London and be able to, to, to navigate and chart their way mentally. This is an apprenticeship of about three years. The first year is so they, they ride around on motor scooters. They don't have any passengers, but they have to learn how to get from Archibald Street in Richmond to um, uh, James Street in Hackney by the fastest route. It's a phenomenally taxing thing to ask the brain to do. And they studied the brains of black cab drivers before and after learning this vast, vast the grid. Knowledge. And they found a pronounced growth in the hippocampus area of the brain. So you could actually see that the brain had grown in mass in the area that was being tasked with this huge chore. And I believe the same thing is, is happening with creativity, is that if you make sustained and heavy demands on, on a certain area of the brain that, is, that, is, that we know is directly linked to creativity, then you're actually growing the mass of your brain. And do you think they have to be creative demands or do they, will intellectual demands do the same thing? Intellectual demands won't grow your creativity. What we're tasked to do is, is more than be intellectual. Oh. Um, a, a lecturer is, is, has a certain skill set and they're using mem capacity of memory and so forth. Um, creative work is a myriad of different areas of the brain um, that we're only just starting to understand and it's unique to us. For example, the use of metaphor. There was a, when I was at university, a professor t gave me a definition of metaphor. He said it is the observation of affinities in two objects where no direct brotherhood exists. Mm -hmm. What makes a poet say that um, I'm as lonely as a cloud? What makes someone say that, compare love to a summer's day? Or Bob Dylan to say that loneliness is like a a, a wind blowing down a highway heading south. What, what in the brain is connecting those disparate ideas and making those linkages? Well, it is, a, it is a factor of poetry and it is a factor of creativity that the ability to grab and seize one idea and, and link it with another in a surprising and interesting way creates a chemical reaction. That if it's the right choice of two to you know, the right products, you get a great idea, a great image. And from those images, we build our work. So that capacity to link disparate ideas together is, is the, the end result of hard work. And that flies in the face of all those books that you can buy saying how to write a screenplay in 21 days and so forth, which are simply attempts to convince you that it is a, a non-mysterious act to create and that all you need is a, some sort of roadmap and you can do it in 21 days or actually the bestseller now is the 10 day screenplay. Um, they're getting faster <coughs> and faster. And what about the subconscious? Is this all related to your creativity emerges from your subconscious, from the sustained creative activity. I mean, how do you, so you develop the creative activity by engaging in creative activity mm -hmm. and the subconscious is... Yeah, that's the bad news. Yeah. That it's, there's no fast way to do it. Yeah. But, yeah, the subconscious is... Plays into it, yeah. Is very much part of it. Dreams. Yeah. Um, anxieties, um, you know your own direct personal experience, um, which then, fo you know, directs you towards social concerns and social issues, which then speak, you know, which are a projection of your own inner reality. And, and that's why we gravitate towards some ideas and not others, because it's somehow, a, a, you know, analogous to our own journey. And it's about accessing that part of yourself. Going there. Going there. And working on it and failing and working and doing it again and doing it again and doing it again until you grow that area of the brain, which is then able to be able to, you know, juggle eight balls at the same time. And what other qualities would you need, as, as character qualities do you think you need in order to operate 
in the most effective way as a creative person? You probably, you know, have to have some sort of trauma at an early age. Um, you don't want to be blessed with that. Whereby the attempt to correct that trauma or account for it um, drives you into uh, into such degrees of perseverance that you will withstand all the horrors of rejection and and self-loathing and you know the bad news that keeps coming at you all the time and it's not normal to want to make yourself lay yourself open to that but that's that's unfortunately um, the industry that that we're all in it's a rejection industry that's the default and if you're not ready to be able to absorb those rejections, in some cases learn from those rejections, um, in large part ignore those rejections, um, then you won't last long. So to, to sustain a long career, you have to have a slight, you know, internal um, makeup, which is probably the result of some compensation. Um, I should have said earlier, this is a discussion, so we'll be looking for input from you and questions from you in a little bit. Mm. Um, what about courage? How big a part does courage play? Um, courage is not a word I would have used about what we do. Um, courage, perhaps in the area where you're flying in the face of orthodoxy. So if you're going to take on a project which is going to, you know is going to offend people, upset people, um, then there's courage in that. Um, and uh, I've had a couple of experiences where people have said to me, I don't think you should take that on, that wouldn't be good for your career, it's not strategic. And you say, but it's the right thing. Th mm. This project is the right thing to do. Mm. Um, so I guess there's an aspect of that, but that's not really the creative process. And what about self-belief? Well, that's, you know, that's something that you put together through amassing enough victories that you, you become much more certain of yourself and assured. But, I, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an Academy of Art in Florence that, that is a five-year academic course. And in the guidelines, it's, it's the only one that exists on such an old-fashioned model, because the old models in Europe throughout the you know the last previous centuries required five to ten years as, as an apprentice before they let you loose. So you worked with the great masters and you learned um, like that. In their guidelines for the Florence Academy, they say that the one thing they're trying to give you is confidence. Mm. After five years to get confident, mm. um, and I thought that was interesting. Well, I, yeah, I agree, and I think confidence, courage, self-belief, it's very hard to do it mm. without, those, mm. without those characteristics. So when you think of yourself now as a writer, particularly recently mm. as a writer, and you think of yourself at the start of your career, mm -hmm. what are the key differences? Confidence. Um, I've... I've now, I feel like I've, to take an analogy, it's like an architect, I feel like I've built a couple of skyscrapers. I started off building bungalows and I didn't make very good bungalows. But along the way I've, I've increased my ambition and my experience and now I've stood there and looked at, wow, I built that. And now people who want skyscrapers, they ring me up and they say, can you do another one for us? And I can go, well, if I've done one, I can probably do two. So that's not something I could have faked early in my career. It just, you've got to do it. You have to build, build your experience, take on more and more ambitious stuff. And if you can then nail it, um, then your confidence grows and people's belief in you grows and the work comes. And when you work, how do you like to Is work? Is this really dull? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not dull for me. Um, when you work, how do you like to work? Do you like to work alone? Do you like to bounce ideas off other people? Do you... I work all the time. 
all the time. It's the, it's the professional hazard of this thing. Yes. It's terrible. But do you, at what point do you start discussing your ideas or showing them around or getting feedback or...? I'm not protective about ideas. I like to, you know, go for a beer with someone and, and, and discuss an idea that is only half formed and sometimes they'll say something and it, you get an, an, a third idea comes out of it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So do, at what point do you like to involve a producer and a director? Um, when you've got something to show them. Right. Yeah. When you're confident with the draft. Yeah. And you've done original screenplays mm -hmm. and you've written adaptations and you've done adaptations of your own work. Mm -hmm. What's, what for you is more rewarding and why and what are the key differences? What do you like doing best? I don't have a preference. Um, the differences are that it's harder to be objective about your own work, obviously. You, you already know the story, so it's hard to come fresh. Mm. And it's one of the, the most vital qualities you can bring as a mentor in a situation like this, is you come fresh to someone's work. Mm. And you can suddenly see what's lacking or what's needed. Um, you lose that objectivity really fast. And then you, when you're coming the second and third time, you're not as useful. So if I'm asked to do, do, you know, adapt my own work, um, then my knowledge of it is too great. And it's very hard to then, you know, fake objectivity. It's that's uh, um, impossible to do. So, um, and yet that's what's required. So what I tend to kind of think is that I try to treat my own novels, if I'm adapting them, as, as if someone else had written them and I'm plagiarizing it um, and stealing from it right. to build something new. And, that, and nothing less than that is required because you are building something entirely new. So you have to take it, dis disassemble it into its constituent parts, and then say, what can serve this new form? And it's such a, such a new form um, that's, uh, that you have to be quite ruthless. And when you're doing it, when you're doing an adaptation of either a story or a novel or someone else's work, what are the key elements you look for that make you think, there's a screen story here. Um, probably the first thing is that if I can see a structure with the whole journey, with the twists and turns um, in it, um, then that will really um, sell me on a project, especially the ending. If I have faith in the ending, um, then setting up all the preconditions before the ending is relatively easy. The ending is critical in movies. It's a deal breaker. Plays can have lousy endings and still be great. Harold Pinter's work, quite, you know, they sort of fizzle out, you know, at the end. But that's the theatre and you're sustained by the, you know, the pyrotechnics of the second and, second and first acts and things. But um, movies are all about the ending. And, um, that's the thing that you're left with when you go home and it should be in the end be the, the, the final message that resounds the whole point of the of the of the journey is contained in that so if i read a book and i can't see the ending i don't i don't sign up for it to adapt it there's a, i'll tell you a, a limerick do you like limericks sure. there was a young man from hibernia who rhymed himself into a hernia he became quite adept at rhyming except for the, ad, except for the odd anticlimax. <laughs> <laughs> now that is, is such an artfully um, told uh, limerick because the author of that limerick knew exactly where he was going with that thing. He deceived us. He knew where to take us and then tricked us at the end. And that's essentially what we're doing with a screenplay. We're, uh, all our screenplays, if they're any good, are extrapolations of that limerick. Mm. The author knew more than we did. Mm. And then they pull, you know, they pull the rug out from, our, from under our expectations at the end. So if you can find a book, a novel, a play, a poem, a limerick that has that ending, you go, ah, mm. 
Mm. It's relatively easy now to turn that into a movie. So that's the first thing. The second thing is characters who I want to order around, who I think, oh my God, to make that character my slave, to put words into that character's mouth will be so delicious um, uh, that it will be a joy to work on. And that's, so that's the second thing. And the third thing is that there is an element of, of social relevance or meaning that will give the work gravity, um, importance, that will either speak to some social concern or some personal inquiry. And then you come away with something that is so, uh, socially relevant. It, it's, it's useful to society and, um, and on an emotional and a social level. If it's got all those three, it's like, yeehaw, you, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you've worked as a playwright. Mm. You've had great success as a playwright. You've had great success as a novelist. Very modest success as a playwright. Great success as a, as a novelist. Modest success as a novelist. And, and one hit as a screenwriter. I shouldn't be up here. I've got, there's so many more people here more accomplished than I am. But how do you build a sustainable life as a writer? Oh, spin as many plates as you can. That, that sort of worked for me. I tried, I realized that, um, that if I was just a novelist, I wouldn't be able to make a living. If I was just a playwright, I wouldn't be able to make a living. And I wanted to make a living. I'm from a working class background and as, uh, my, all my brothers are tradesmen and so forth and they can make a living. So I wanted to make a living out of it and make it a trade. And, and, um, and to do that, coming from a little place in New Zealand which doesn't sustain its artists, it's too small to sustain its artists, um, I had to try and diversify and do all, you know, be a jack of all trades. So I moved now between all three of those mediums and um, trying to keep them all going. Um, now I, I'm doing well enough in, in um, cinema that I could probably just forego the other two, but um, I happen to love them, so still trying to do all three. And um, given the huge success and acclaim for the theory of everything, how, do, how does one capitalise on that? How does one keep the momentum going, keep the phone ringing? Um, make wise choices based on those three principles I, I, I mentioned before. Um, if you do that, then you're going to be um, confident about your ability to deliver on those next projects. If you simply chase the money with your next opportunity, not having ticked those three boxes, you could get yourself into serious trouble. And a lot of people do that. They get a little break, the phone rings, and they jump into a genre movie that they're not really equipped to tell. It doesn't mean anything to them. And, you know, and they get unstuck. And some people get diverted off in those false directions and they never come back from that. Mm. So... It's a hazardous life. Yeah. It's, it's a terrific life. We're so lucky. We're the, the lucky, lucky... 0.1%, I think, mm. if you can make a living in what we do. Mm. It's a crime. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Um, let's throw it open for questions. Any questions? I don't know. I've, it's an interesting question. I've never really confronted that. The most intelligent people you meet are funny. So, um, given that you want to be working with intelligent people to make intelligent films, then you're going to invariably be working with people with a sense of humour. Um, and I'm, the people I'm working with at the moment, I think, are quite best in that regard. Um, I can't think of anyone that I'm dealing with right now with whom I have a meeting with and there aren't a whole bunch of attempts at humour. Um, so, yeah, the mediocre are humourless. What, what did Winston Churchill say? That you can't contemplate the serious things in life unless you're able to understand the funniest. Um, so, yes, pick your friends well, your colleagues even better. Yeah. He is a funny guy and his previous scripts are very funny. Very funny. 
Oh, okay. Funny, I amuse you? <laughs> I'm a you know <laughs>it was it was my little ace up my sleeve that project um i sensed that it, w it had the potential to reach a, a wide audience and do something in my career that nothing else had done before mainly because stephen hawking was such a fascinating cr creature if i could refer to him as, as in that way secondly because his personal journey was so extraordinary that i don't i never thought it anything like it had been captured on film before um and um and yet, I couldn't get anybody interested in it. Um, the, the things that I was interested in were the things that turned other people off. The fact that he was a physicist, which fascinated me, um, is a negative in Hollywood. The fact that he's in a wheelchair and communicates through a voice machine to the ears of producers is a turn-off because there's no car chase possibility in that, in that idea. Um, and then the fact that um, there was a triangular love story where his wife, his, Stephen basically gave his wife permission to take a lover, which was deeply fascinating on an on a, uh, on a emotional level, was a turn off be to producers because they were saying, well, you know, we'll stop sympathizing with her and we won't um, be rooting for her, as they say in LA. Um, so it was, it was a devil of a job to get producers on board and see the potential in it. Um, and it took eight years to convince Jane Hawking, whose book my screenplay was based on, to give me permission. But all that aside, I sensed this was something that could change things for me. I had a deep, deep um, feeling for this project. So I persevered and I got on a train and unknown to her, I knocked on her door she came to the door and um, I introduced myself and said, I um, have fallen in love with her autobiography and I would like to turn it into a feature film if she would give me her blessing. And she invited me inside and gave me sandwiches and a glass of sherry. And we began a conversation um, that lasted eight years. Um, she toyed with me mercilessly suggested she would sign, give me the rights, but always withheld it. Um, more sherry, more club sandwiches. The years went by, um, and only when we finally attached a director um, did she finally sign on the line. And then as soon as we had that, and we had a director, then it was, it was a whole different thing. The, the, once you package a project around an idea, and you have a director that means something, and then you go into the same people who would have ignored you. Suddenly they're all over themselves and they'll write you a check immediately. So I learned a great deal about, about packaging your idea as well, mm. and about what a difference that makes. Because these, the financiers of films are into trying, trying to evaluate the, the money-making potential in your idea. And they're very restricted in, in, in their ability to assess that. Um, they don't trust their own instincts on the script. They apply a very, very narrow frame of reference into evaluating its, its potential, market potential. Um, and if it isn't like something else that's already been made that made a lot of money, then they're kind of stuck and they're not sure. So they're gonna sit on the fence, mess you around. But if you come in with something that's entirely new and original, which challenges their, their judgment, but you have an Oscar-winning director who sits down in the room and goes, don't worry about it, I've got it. Then they relax and they sign checks. Um, and I was unable to persuade the money people to fund it, but once we had a director, we suddenly had, I don't know, 25 companies immediately fighting with each other to fund this previously unwanted screenplay. And the fact that it um, was eight years waiting for the green light, mm. did the screenplay change much during those eight years? A little bit, but not greatly. No. No, essentially had, we had the ending nailed and we had the, the middle and the beginning was all leading up to it nicely. 
So we, we made some, um, some cuts and efficiencies in mm. the script, but essentially that was it. Mm. And then when you make it, everyone goes, oh, what a tremendous story, and you know. Mm. Oh, and that's what you all have. You all have your scripts, and you're, you're packaging them now, and you're going to sit with the financiers, and they're going to say, I'm not sure if we're gonna, we can make any money. Will there be an audience for this? Um, but if you have a deep faith and engagement in your story and you persevere and then you attach either some talent or a director, which most of you probably even have directors attached. Um, How did the director come on board? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, we tried quite a few people. Quite a few turned us down. Um, and their reasons were always decorous and um, uh, kind of sympathetic and sweet, um, but uh, for them it didn't speak to them. And so we just knocked on more doors and knocked on more doors. And we finally found uh, this director who'd won an Oscar for a documentary, Man on Wire. Mm. And um, he saw its potential and, uh, and that made all the difference. Great story. Yeah. Yep. Any more questions? That wasn't a problem. No, no. Dime a dozen. Yeah, yeah. No, never a problem finding producers. They're always looking for material, and if it's interesting and new, then um, then you'll find one. So I've got one last question. Um, how important is it that a writer knows where they need to be? in order to be at their most creative, I mean geographically, where they need to live. Is that, do you think that's an element in the writing life, knowing where to live and knowing where you should be? My, my agents are very deeply fearful that I'll move to Los Angeles. And I, I, and I want to move to Los Angeles. I, I just want some sun. And, but they're saying, oh no, don't, don't come, oh, don't come, don't come, it'll all dry up, it'll all dry up, all your, interesting intellectual ideas and everything. You'll be like everyone else. You'll, you'll be writing Marvel movies and don't, you know, don't do that. Don't Lovely guy, stay where you are. Stay where it's cold and hostile and, and where you're on edge and unhappy. Stay unhappy, you know. <laughs> you know. But for me, I no, it's irrelevant where I am. I ride on train carriages. I've been riding here. But you told me before you like to live in the city. You like to live where the, where the excitement is. Yeah, well, that's true. That suits my nature. So it stops me going to sleep to be in a hyperactive city. Um, Lon and London is fantastic. There's phenomena there that you just don't see anywhere else. Yeah. I liken it to, you know, the, the large Hadron Collider that they've built in CERN where they generate magnificent mega loads of energy and then they fire these particles together and then they're, they're looking f to observe phenomena that can only happen when this amount of energy is all trained on one micro point. Yeah. London's a bit like that. It has all these enormous uh, cyclonic energies and they collide and, and, and create phenomena you don't quite see anywhere else. And that's great to observe. So, you know, that's useful. But um, I don't think I'm creatively dependent on that, but it's... Um, no. But it, yeah. it gives you... It energy. stimulates, yeah. Yeah, it stimulates. Yeah. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I think we should repair to the aperitif. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anthony. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.